told me it might be easier to follow. This is bad. Okay. I will use the computer later, but it's good to Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's not anymore the morning, actually, yes. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I am chairing this panel on unmaking peacemaking in the Middle East, which is actually uh, to be framed in a wider uh, perspective because is some way a flavor of a book that I've been editing it is going to be published by the end of the year by Routledge in London. And um, what we are presenting today are some aspects of this wider project that began almost uh, three years ago. Uh, and it uh, came up at the juncture of different questions that I was sharing with a number of colleagues and uh, PhD students uh, around uh, the field of both policy and academic interventions, which is the one broadly defined under the levels of peacemaking, peacebuilding, peacekeeping. Uh, the interest to look at this wider field was motivated by a number of factors. The first one, definitely the fact that uh, in the post-Cold War, uh, peace had resumed for a number of international institutions, among them the UN in particular, its uh, full importance. Some way, during the years of the Cold War, issue of peacebuilding and peacemaking had been, had been kept quite dormant. And in the aftermath of the Cold War, uh, with, among others, the peace building initiatives and uh, plans and agendas set up successively by Boutros Boutros Ghali and then uh, Kofi Annan in two revised versions, 
the question of peace building uh, became paramount and in some ways sets in motion a sort of an industry of peace. Industry of peace that could be, can be analyzed at different levels through different social actors that have been contributing to shape it. But there was one specific angle that uh, from a research perspective um, we deemed important to analyze, to interrogate. Most notably, the production of knowledge around peace building and peacemaking that uh, had been accumulating over the years. Actually, the question of knowledge uh, is embodied by a number, not only of institutions, but especially of individuals often labeled as peace experts. Uh, and under this label, you can group uh, not only UN civil servants and experts on issues related to peace building, but as well as academics, policy makers, think tanks, NGOs, uh, briefly an array of institutions and social actors that have been contributing uh, um, over the years to produce different kinds of knowledge, uh, influencing uh, at different levels processes of peacemaking. So around this uh, wider objective, we decided in particular to focus on a geographical area, which is the Middle East, because uh, more than other areas, geographical areas, the Middle East seem to us quite understudied in terms of knowledge production on peacemaking. On the other side, the, when we look at other adjacent fields, such as the broader field of development or the one of the humanitarian field, those other fields have been received much more attention and uh, a more pronounced historical um, perspective with a number of reflexive uh, studies, meaning of social actors implicated in development and humanitarian field that have been, they themselves, um, uh, reflecting critically upon their endeavors. In the peacemaking field, um, the moral lenses and imperatives uh, seem to be dominating uh, the analysis of the field, or let's say, the lack of analysis of the field. Therefore, with uh, a group of colleagues and PhD students, we set up a, a project that was trying to analyze different levels uh, of what we call the peacemaking, peacebuilding industry. Uh, and we focused in particular on the Middle East with uh, a main attention on two countries, Palestine and Lebanon, with then a number of uh, larger um, papers on the region. Therefore, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, you will be able to see the volume that will contain uh, around uh, uh, a number of topics uh, and around a number of countries, the problematic that we have been developing to give you uh, a quick uh, overview. Uh, for example, concerning Lebanon, uh, three uh, young Lebanese uh, scholars have been successively interrogating uh, on the one side the role of a of the think tanks between Lebanon and Switzerland over particular cases of cooperation in the post-2005 period. Um, uh, this is mainly the work of Lina Komati, who teaches now at the American University in Beirut. Uh, Susan Kassem has been exploring uh, the different mandates and evolution of the mandates of UNIFIL in southern Lebanon around the question of peacekeeping. Uh, Zina Sawaf has been focusing in particular on the role of a number of NGO directors in their production of expertise at, through uh, peace dialogues at the local level. Um, other uh, colleagues working on Palestine uh, have been producing work, two of them, uh, I'll introduce them 
in for this panel. Uh, Xavier Guignard has been working uh, on a very interesting topic, which is the PLO uh, uh, negotiation unit by analyzing uh, the role of the young Palestinian experts and their role uh, over the past two decades in the uh, political negotiations. And then uh, we had some other uh, wider uh, perspectives, such as one on hydropolitics by Mauro Van Aken, who is professor at the University of Milan, um, which, works on, which has been working on the question of expertise and hydropolitics across Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. Um, today, as I said uh, before, uh, the aim was to give you a flavor of uh, this book uh, through three presentations. Um, the first one will be by uh, Haseman Namla, uh, who is focusing uh, on the question of uh, the peace building uh, uh, industrial complex in Palestine, basically by analyzing uh, in over the past two decades and a half um, from the beginning of the so-called peace process during the Oslo years and afterwards, the evolution of uh, what he termed the uh, peace industrial complex, um, then uh, Mandy Turner will have uh, a more historical perspective uh, on peace building uh, in Palestine, basically from uh, the end of the mandate period up uh, to today, and she will be presenting uh, a, an important perspective on peace building as a counterinsurgency perspective. Um, and finally, we will have a more regional perspective by Gregoire Mallard uh, on the uh, role of nuclear talks and peace. I will introduce successively the three speakers, and uh, now I give the floor to Hazem and Namla. Hazem is a Palestinian PhD student at the Institute who has um, a former background of researchers in uh, two uh, Palestinian institution, the Palestinian NGO network, and uh, for Baysan Center, where he worked uh, on questions related mainly to civil society and peace building. Hazem, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. Um, So I'm start to talk about the peace-building industrial complex in the context of Palestine, Israel, and kind of focus on a period that starts from late 80s, uh, early 90s, up until uh, today. Um, basically, I'm going to focus on the, um, a network of institutions and organizations that come under the terms that we uh, developing here, the, uh, the peace-building industrial complex, and this network is Though it will be appearing in our in my presentation that is coherent, however, it's so diverse. Sometimes even they contradict each other. Nonetheless, there is a unity that uh, unifies them, which is the peace building or their understanding for specific practices of peace building. To do this presentation, I will ask you just to use your imagination when you start looking at any map for the West Bank and Gaza and the heaviness that you will feel from the fragmentation of the different uh, spaces and geographies inside. That comes from the uh, checkpoints, the settlements, the bypass roads, and the separation wall that has been constructed over the last 10, 10 or so years. This uh, fragmentation spaces that's called the West Bank and Gaza, or the occupied Palestine territories in Palestine and Israel, does not affect only the, daily, the spatial daily life of Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza, but however goes beyond that to any geographical locations for Palestinians. A small example of that, if anybody wants to send or to speak with their relatives uh, in the West Bank, they have to go mentally through where they are, what's their neighborhood, how they come uh, out, or how the message, even a phone call, how it will be received and what will affect the community. In parallel to that fragmentation and the heaviness of the fragmentation, there is a, a consolidated understanding of where this 
spatial life is happening? What is the time of that spatial life? Which is, we consider it as the peace building process or the peace, uh, the peace process that started in early 90s. And mainly they focus on a series of events started from uh, 1988 when the PLO declared uh, recognition for the 242 and 338 UN resolutions. Um, and they declared the state of Palestine on the territories that was occupied in 67, followed that by the Madrid Peace Conference. Then the uh, signing of the Oslo, uh, the Oslo Agreement in 1993, which it becomes the event that define the Middle East for uh, the next period. Then it comes another event, which is the Second Intifada in 2000, the roadmap in 2003, Annapolis Conference in 2007, and then uh, the ongoing negotiations on the negotiation that happening under the Barack Obama administration. <clears throat> Between this spatial fragmentation and the consolidation of the time, the, industry, the peace process industrial uh, complex being created, and basically it is how those different organizations in the ground approaches this space and time that we call it uh, Palestine-Israel, and how specifically analyze the event that created this spatial uh, fragmentation and consolidated time that is the Oslo, uh, uh, the Oslo Agreement or the Oslo events. And here we, I can identify three main approaches or three main schools in reading Oslo events. The first one, which is act or deal with Oslo as a political event, basically the try to analyze the structure of power that happens within Oslo, whether the negotiation process and why the Israelis suddenly agreed to uh, come to table with the PLO, or why the PLO, who up until that moment was losing the, uh, the fight, uh, decided to go on that uh, uh, trip to sign uh, the Oslo Agreement. And there was a lot of analysis on the personality or the people behind the Oslo Agreement and how is Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, Saeb Arikat, Abul Ala, those are the key people who are facilitated, or Shoma Peres facilitated the signing and the signature of the peace process, and how the Norwegian um, provided a secretive place for them to negotiate and sit together and reach the agreement. What's Interesting in this point of view is the over-analysis or the over-focus on the document itself, the document that's been signed, what it means, what sort of representation uh, appears there, and who is going to do what, when, and where. And within this point of view, both, uh, both approaches existed. A critical one, like Edward Said presented, that says like it was a defeat in all political uh, meaning of the word defeat for the Palestinian and the PLO to sign the agreement. And there was a victory for the Israelis to impose their conditions on the Palestinians. Or it was like a celebratory uh, moment where, and that was represented uh, through different uh, front offices around the world, where is finally a peace can be achieved uh, in the Middle East. The second point of view, or the second uh, approach to the Oslo events that uh, happens in parallel to the first one, it's reading the Oslo event as a post-colonial moment. It's basically like they focus on the aftermath of the agreement, what it established on the ground, the whole division of the West Bank between area P, A, B, and C, and who controls each area, and the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. And they read it that gradually the PA, the Palestinian Authority, become a subcontractor for the occupation, which is doing the dirty work of the occupation and leaving the Israelis to control the totality of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And the third point, or the third approach of viewing the Oslo event, which is also as well it happened or exists in the same uh, um, space with the other approaches, is reading Oslo as a yet another a new liberal uh, processes that hits the region. Meaning like Oslo itself, it's not an event. 
and the agreement and the signature of the agreement is just like a starting or like a manifestation of a processes that already started with the region, with the entering of the uh, IMF on the World Bank to the region, how it affects the region, the Arab countries as well as Israel, how they transfer their economies, the idea of uh, good governance, the ideas of uh, liberal economies, and how Oslo, it is a manifestation of those processes. So for the third approach, it does not recognize Oslo as that event or an event, an important event, as much as it recognizes it as a process that's continuous. Within these three pro approaches, I'm going to give specific examples of how uh, a knowledge production materialized within those three. I'm going to talk about Rex Brynan's uh, books, which is called A Very Political Economy, uh, Peace Building and Foreign Aid Industry in the West Bank and Gaza as a representation of the first approach, which is reads the, the Oslo as a political event. While Mushtaq Khan uh, edited book, The Formation of the State of Palestine, is a representation of a post-colonial event. And the work of Rand Corporation, the building a successful Palestinian state, is understood as uh, an example of the third approach. Now, Looking at those three examples, and in general, all the publications about peace buildings in Palestine, Israel, we were, I was not, and like because I'm writing this paper in uh, cooperation with Ricardo, we were not looking for specific representations or misrepresentation in that manner. However, we are looking of how the processes of representing certain dynamic and certain formulation is happening and it's occurring. If I go to Rex's uh, uh, book, The Very Political Economy, what's very important in his analysis is focusing on how we can train the international donors and the local uh, actives, how we can bring them together to deliver a very um, coherent peace building that reflect uh, not just the intentions of Oslo that eventually will end up with a Palestinian state, but like as well as like ending corruptions, uh, dealing with the uh, political issues of diversity that exist uh, with, between the two communities and uh, as Palestine Israel. The main problem with, or not problem, the problematic with Rex Bernin uh, book was the focus in creating um, a kind of a model that you can apply it in the context of Palestine, Israel. So you have a process that's well-defined with the steps. And those processes, you can touch it, you can understand it through uh, statistical data. So you can know how, many, uh, how much money you send to certain organization or to certain programs, and what is the outcome of that program. Bit by bit, reading that book and analyzing that book, you will have a feeling that what is the macro level or what is the whole peace process, it's about a small micro events, small projects on the ground, a project here and a project there, that collectively become uh, the peace process. That approach completely ignores, to some extent, the history part of the conflict, or the, 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 the vacuum that where those uh, uh, activities is taking place. And that was also the beginning of Mushtaq Khan's book and the, his criticism on uh, similar uh, publication like The Very Political Economy, where he started by saying, assuming there will be a Palestinian state at the end of the Oslo, it was a false promise, because Oslo has been designed from the moment not to reach that, that point. It created a situation where you have a rent society, as he called it, that will not be able to transfer into uh, um, a state from one side. From the other side, it also created a community of corruption Corruption becomes a necessity within that 
uh, framework that Oslo created because it is the only source of power. It is the only source of continuity. It's the only source of uh, establishing uh, sort of a political entity within uh, West Bank and Gaza. Those two approaches are those two books. deals with the agreement itself and not try to go beyond those agreements, not try to go beyond the activities that those agreements, uh, these agreements, the Oslo agreements is trying to create. And also it fails at the same time to understand the, the second intifada. It suddenly happened for them without like a framework of why it happened, how it will, uh, to where it will lead. But Again, also these two books find their refuge in 2007 when Salam Fayyad became uh, the prime minister in uh, the PA, and they call, start calling or this, this start the formulation of what they call a new liberal um, agenda in Palestine. Of Fayyadism after uh, uh, Thomas Friedman called uh, Salam Fayyad as the Fayyadism which is basically talking about the technocrats' governments that comes with a, uh, loaded with agendas from the um, uh, new liberal approach toward peace process and uh, implementing it on, uh, on reality. Those two books find the refuge there because then it solves the problem that they did not cover or the, the problems that the uh, two approaches of post-colonial and political events that did not cover. If I go quickly to the third book, which is the Rand uh, Corporation uh, uh, publication about successful peace building, successful uh, state building in Palestine. It's very ironic that suddenly Palestine or the issue of Palestinian state, it, it left the arena of um, self-determination or the struggle or the colonial struggle and it becomes a calculations. You have a document of 700 pages that calculate how much it costs to build a Palestinian state, how mu what is the alternative, and how it is economically viable, not just for the Palestinians, for, for the whole region as a project, as a, an economic project to build a Palestinian state. And what's interesting in that understanding is like they divided the issues in Palestine, Israel, into political and technical. The political, which is they don't, you will never find what is political. It goes to the negotiation table that the two parties will negotiate on. And then there is the technical issues, which is goes there, that covers almost everything in the daily life in Palestine. It becomes a investment opportunities for people to invest in to, and to have a, a revenue. Sorry, I, my points are missing here. So I think I'm gonna stop here and like just collect my thoughts and maybe in the answer questions, I can come back to it. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Aizen. Uh, I'd like now to give the floor to Mandy Turner who is presently the director of the Kenyan Institute, which is part of the Council of the British Research on the Levant. Um, Mandy Turner has been for a number of years uh, the director of the Institute based in Jerusalem, and she is, is a specialist uh, on Western peace building practices with a main focus on the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, she has been the author of several uh, publications and two uh, coming uh, soon are um, published uh, by Routledge uh, as well. Uh, one uh, will be called, will be titled Politics of International Intervention, which is due to come out by the fall of this year, and another one on decolonizing Palestinian economy, which are two edited volumes that she has uh, 
contributed to set up. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ricardo. <clears throat> I've got a terrible cold, so please um, bear with me. Um, I think it's the Hamzin that we're having in Jerusalem at the moment. It's really got to me. Anyway, you've got a nice projection here, so we should be okay, I think. Um, so my perspective may seem a little bit tangential to the theme of this panel, but I'm hoping that it provokes some critical discussion. Because I'm not really focusing so much on how peace experts produce knowledge as such, um, although I'm really happy to talk about this in the Q&A, particularly given that I've just conducted another round of interviews with heads of development agencies in uh, the OPT and, and UN officials. But what I'm going to do today is to base um, my talk on a recent article I had published in the Review of International Studies, where I propose a new conceptual framework um, if you like, a paradigm shift for how we understand uh, peace building. Now, it applies to all examples, but um, I'm only applying it to the uh, OPT at the moment, um, and I think it'll uh, complement uh, what Hazem has just said. Now, Western peace building in the OPT has been frequently and extensively criticised. There's a massive literature out there that criticises uh, the peace building uh, industry as much as proposes it. Now, one of the main criticisms uh, seems to be that there's a contradiction in promoting Palestinian institutions, governance structures and economic development in preparation for sovereignty in the context of Israel's occupation and colonial practices. Um, now, peace building also stands accused of not delivering peace. Um, now, despite writing quite a few articles myself which uh, argue this, I'm, not lo I'm no longer convinced there's a contradiction. And in the article in Review International Studies, I set out why, and I'm going to try and shortly uh, explain in, in a shortened fashion today. Now, my argument is, is that if Western donor-led peace building, and I'm specifically focusing on donor-led, not on the NGOs who I think do a lot of good work, but on the donor-led uh, peace building, then if we understand it as a form of counterinsurgency whose goal is to secure a population, then actually these contradictions vanish. And we can see that actually peace building has, has actually not failed in the OPT, and quite, quite the contrary, it's largely succeeded. There is a peace, it's a very violent colonial peace, but it's, there is a peace. So if we explicitly relabel peace building as counterinsurgents in the OPT, I am arguing that this provides us with a deep sociological grammar to comprehend policies and practices that on first glance appear contradictory when we take for granted uh, what the peace builders say they're doing, but they're not actually contradictory when we look at through the lens of counterinsurgency which unashamedly focuses on stabilisation. Now, modern counterinsurgency doctrine, um, or COIN, as uh, the military strategists talk about, has largely focused on military tactics. And it's become fashionable again, largely because of uh, the US trying to struggle to understand why its adventures in Afghanistan and Iraq have gone so drastically wrong. However, despite this military focus and underpinning, the core message of counterinsurgency doctrine, both of the traditional French and British variety used in the Age of Empire, as well as this more modern US variety used in the so-called War on Terror, is that it's actually based on a wider perspective than just military tactics and boots on the ground. If you look at the core doctrine, it's actually based on the idea that successfully securing a population and immunising it against unrest requires quite extensive strategies in the realm of governance, development and security. Now, Western donor-led peace building activities also focus on these spheres, although, of course, they have a proclaimed positive goal of developing mechanisms to reduce or avoid a violent conflict and to build a sustainable peace. But as I say, if we actually relabel peace building as counterinsurgency, 
we can see that we're actually looking at a focus on stabilisation. I've frequently asked peace builders, for example, so why are you building institutions? Why are you trying to develop the OPT? And many of them say we want to see a Palestinian state emerge, we want to see peace in the region. However, their actions don't always uh, uh, tally with what they say they're doing. Now, I would, I'm, I'm arguing that the money and effort that's put into peace building to stable, is to stabilise this area and to actually secure the population. And I don't think that the OPT is, is any different from other examples around the world, but I think its context gives it a very unique flavour. Um, and I came to this conclusion after nine years of researching and writing about peace building and donor practices in the OPT. And, and for me, there were so many contradictions. Um, and I was getting increasingly angry that leading diplomats would happily tell me off the record that they knew what was going on, um, but that peace building and the OPT had to continue because of their government's foreign policy objectives. So today I'm going to make three claims. The first claim is that there's a deep structural symbiosis in the logic and methods of counterinsurgency and peace building. While the language is different, the strategies have a similar underlying rationale. Both promote forms of governance, development and security, which is to instill acquiescence and ensure control. There is a fusion in the goals and the strategies, and this is not merely coincidental. The second claim that I make is that what, what is normally labelled as the Israel-Palestine conflict is actually a vicious cycle of insurgency and counterinsurgency as Palestinians resist the colonisation of their land and the suppression of their rights. And the third claim that I make is that the peace-building strategies of state-building, security sector reform and neoliberal economics that have been pursued since the 1993 Oslo Accords are actually a form of counterinsurgency deployed against the Palestinians. Now, peace building's image as a benign method to reduce conflict is merely that, an image. Relations of power are inherent in all examples of peace building, not merely because there's often a situation of aid dependency and the deep involvement of donors in the governance structures. But there's also a process of empowering communities through peace building, which actually involves the selection of which people to empower, which section of the elite to actually empower. And this, um, I would argue, rapidly descends into justifications and the practice of exclusion and coercion. Now, in the context of the OPT, intrusive peace building practices and aid dependency um, have instituted a control regime that masks and enhances an already existing structure of domination and repression. The main relationship of power is between Israel, the colonizer, and the colonized Palestinians, and this relationship has not changed. But to this, we must add and understand a second relationship of power between the internationals uh, represented by the peace building agencies and the locals, uh, the Palestinians. Now, donor peace building in the OPT operates as another la layer of pacification techniques that have complemented and meshed with the structures of repression and domination created by Israel. Now, some may say that I'm being rather harsh. We are in UN'sville, after all. We all know people who work for Western donor organisations whose hearts are in the right place. Many of them are my friends. Um, but this is a structural issue. This is not about agency or choice. This is a structural analysis um, that I'm positing. Now, when I've uh, presented this argument before, for example, at the International Studies Association conference earlier this year, some people argued with me that counterinsurgency is purely a military doctrine and that I'm, I'm wrong in comparing it with peace building and that I'm kind of comparing apples and pears. But I think there's something very interesting going on that we miss if we take for granted that the labels mean something different. We can actually see a very interesting symbiosis historically and structurally when we trace the fields of counterinsurgency, Western donor development strategies, and the emergence of peace building in the post-Cold War world that Ricardo referred to earlier. 
So um, please indulge me for a few minutes while I try and set out the symbiosis. Now, counterinsurgency has a very long history as a method of stabilisation. The colonial powers used it in an attempt to control anti-colonial movements within their empires, and the US has long utilised them uh, during the Cold War to control and defeat nationalist um, and socialist movements that they saw were challenging their economic and strategic interests. We can actually see this if we look at um, the involvement of the British in Malaya, through to the French in Algeria and Indochina, through to the Americans in Vietnam and Latin America. And what's really interesting is that they all learn from each other and they study each other's experiences. You can actually see this uh, very clearly when you read their documents. Now, the first US counterinsurgency manual that's explicitly stated these uh, objectives was actually an interagency cooperation between the Departments of Defence, Foreign Affairs and Development. And this actually continues to the present day. The last counterinsurgency manual was also a tripartite uh, interagency cooperation. Now, the UK's development agency, DFID, has its origins in the various offices that dealt with the colonies um, as well as with the Foreign Office. And in 2001, um, the UK established what is known as the Global Conflict Prevention Pool, which marries um, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence and DFID, the Development Agency, into one mechanism for managing and funding the UK's contribution to violent conflict prevention globally. Now, these interconnections between the State Departments of Foreign Policy, Defence and Development can be traced with all OEC donors, and this is what I think is very interesting. Now, in the now, now we're in the post-Cold War world and largely post-colonial world. These techniques have remained central to the global control strategies pursued by the West. The key message is that by uh, immunising countries against uprisings, we need to be involved in uh, development assistance, um, supporting sympathetic elites and training militaries. Now, again, this doesn't come just out of the top of my head. This actually comes from looking at the history of counterinsurgency practices and uh, analyses of these practices and the more modern Western government's counterinsurgency manuals. I've also looked at the strategic defence documents of the OECD donors that actually interest they elaborate on the use of other forms of power rather than just military intervention. Um, we need to take note of this, I think, when we understand what they're doing. Now, while I was exploring these documents, it really became clear to me that counterinsurgency stabilisation practice has an incredible amount of overlap with the concepts and practices of peace building strategy, as we've seen expressed through documents, uh, the UN documents such as an agenda for peace in 1992, where the first uh, iteration of the concept of peace building was made. The 2004 document, A More Secure World, and the more recent document, In Larger Freedom. And all of these activities are expressed through the type of peace building practices that have been undertaken by Western donors and international organisations that are funded by these uh, Western donors. Now, I would like to argue that there's, um, there's a symbiosis between the principles and goals of peace building and counterinsurgency. And this really shouldn't be controversial, I think, because many Western states actually openly express that their international development strategies, particularly in what they refer to as fragile or failing states, um, which include the conflict-affected ones, such as the OPT, they actually argue that their development strategies are working to advance stabilisation and counterinsurgency. They're very explicit about this. Now, of course, the language of counterinsurgency is not the language that the peace building and development community use. The analytical categories we see in the peace building lexicon include things like the so-called security development nexus and the concept of human security. And these two have influenced a, a swathe of peace building activities, labelled as state building, security sector reform, good governance, rule of law, capacity building. Anybody who works in this field were um, dazzled by all of these different concepts that uh, continually come out. Now, what's interesting is General, General David Petraeus, who wrote the 2006 US counterinsurgency manual, 
saw this symbiosis. And um, in a conversation with Professor Mary Calder from the London School of Economics, who's one of the major proponents of the concept of human security, he told Mary Calder that actually the two concepts of human security and counterinsurgency had the same principles and goals. Uh, Mary was a little bit horrified, but uh, that's another story. Now, there are a number of ways in which um, I trace the symbiosis between counterinsurgency and peace building in this article. Please download it, or if you want a copy, I'm quite happy to send it to you. Now, I can't go into these, obviously, because I've not got time today. Um, but what is clear from uh, the documents and strategy in the OPT is that there is uh, a commonality between peace building and counterinsurgency. Now, I begin when I start analysing the uh, application of it to the OPT. I emphasise that the Palestinian struggle for self-determination is hugely significant in the history of insurgency and counterinsurgency. And Ricardo referred to uh, the, the sections of the article, which I'm actually I'm turning this article into a book at the moment, looks at the way in which um, counterinsurgency doctrine was developed by the British uh, on the mandate period. Now, Palestine is, is internationally significant for a number of reasons. Firstly, it remains uh, one of the last, uh, perhaps, anti-colonial struggles in a period regarded as largely post-colonial. Um, now, Palestinians are struggling against a coloniser which has the support of the world's largest state, most powerful state, the US. And Israel is able to invoke a moral rationale based on the long history of suffering of the Jewish people. That makes it a, a very powerful, uh, powerful uh, person to uh, a state to have to argue against. But what's interesting is that Palestinians in Palestine have seem to have become a bit of a key symbol in the struggle for global justice. And uh, for example, in the U.S. city of Ferguson, um, when we saw demonstrations against police brutality and racism, people were carrying banners uh, and wore T-shirts which stated solidarity with the Palestinians. So Palestine, although it's a very small area, and you'd be very surprised how small when you travel around, it has huge international significance. Um, and I think that this is important for, this is why it's important for us to understand what's going on there. Um, so we really have to understand Israel's history also as therefore a history of the suppression of Palestinian rights. Israel's colonial pacification techniques have been amply documented, and I go into them in, in a lot of detail in the article. It's not easy to criticise Israel in the modern period. Therefore, I am absolutely 100% uh, in all my documentation. There's a variety of methods that are used. Now, Israel's aim of creating and expanding its state and securing dominance over the land and resources of historic Palestine, with the least amount of Palestinians on it, has actually created a structural imperative of control and displacement, although Israel obviously justifies its actions in the name of security. Now, the signing of the Oslo Accord and the creation of the Palestinian Authority did not change this relationship. Um, Israel remains a sovereign power, despite the fact that this relationship has kind of masked this fact. Many critics of Oslo have pointed this out and Hazem's referred to them but my argument goes one step further. So not only did Oslo allow Palestinians to outsource control over the Palestinian population to a Palestinian-led governance structure, it also meant that Israel's counterinsurgency strategies were then supplemented by techniques and mechanisms introduced by very well-meaning uh, international peacebuilding actors that appeared very benign. Um, Western peacebuilders managed to therefore implement some of the more subtle methods of counterinsurgency that have eluded Israel, the ones that are designed to immunise a population against unrest through creating a form of self-policing. I then trace the counterinsurgency peace building symbiosis in the OPT through three main areas, through development assistance, through government governance strategies, and through security coordination. I'm just, how am I doing for time, Ricardo? Okay. Um, so just to very briefly touch on, on these things and show you how I use this um, framework. So in the area of governance, um, Western strategies have focused on supporting Palestinian elites who have accepted the vision of peace on offer and have actually helped embed their power in opposition to others who have rejected this vision of peace. 
Now, I go into this in a lot more depth, but this is the, the uh, general framework. Now, I've labelled this the Partners for Peace framework, uh, par Partners for Peace paradigm, because there's a general overuse of this phrase in this context, and it's, and it's applied in an extremely clever way. Okay, so when we... To, aid to prop up preferred peace partners is very common in peace process, and it's actually a very uh, central characteristic of peace building. But in this context, in the specific context of the OPT, the definition of sympathetic or unsympathetic elites is defined as those that Israel with, will negotiate with um, and who are also acceptable to the US. So the big question is just who is the preferred partner for peace? The bottom line is Israel and the US decides. So this is a very crucial uh, method of control. In the area of economic development, Western strategies have focused on supporting the development of infrastructure and a Palestinian business elite with vested interests in ensuring stability. Again, OK, this is how capitalism works, um, particularly in a development context. But this is also taking place within a regional economic system which is designed to normalise relations between Israel and the Arab states. Um, and what it's actually done, interestingly, is it's intensifies, intensified the dependency of the Palestinians on Israel. And this has become another very important form of control. In the third area of security, uh, Western peace-building strategies have focused on the creation of a Palestinian security force able to enforce stability and security for Israel. Again, okay, the suppression of domestic opposition to, to, sta to state building is common throughout the history of the development of states. We've all read Charles Tilley, etc. But in this specific context, this has also meant promoting and regulating security coordination between Israel and the PA under conditions of occupation and colonization. This is another really important form of control. And so the picture emerges of a political economy that is the outcome of the interactions of the policies and practices of Israel, the Western donors, and different sections of the Palestinian elite under the auspices of peace building as structured by the Oslo Accords. Now, peace building has therefore complemented and meshed with the structures of domination and repression created by Israel in subtle but crucial ways that are not always visible but, and are often very difficult to detect and they appear benign and well-meaning. But in essence, the goal is to stabilise the region, which requires the dismantling of Palestinian resistance to Israel's colonisation practices, and to try and ensure that they continue to acquiesce to the fragmentation of their body politic. Now, Western build, peace builder, and I would argue problematically, has become a key part of this colonisation and fragmentation process while at the same time managing to portray itself is trying to reduce or at least manage its impacts. Now, some will probably criticise me in the Q&A for lumping all the donors and the peace building agencies together because we know that some are more problematic than others and actually some are more well-meaning than others. But donor relationships and roles in the OPT reflect global structures of power. The US dominates in this regard, and all the other donors tend not to challenge American positions for self-interested policy uh, reasons, although tensions and frictions have arisen on occasions, and I've, I've, uh, we've seen this uh, quite recently. Now, a recent round of interviews that I conducted with the donor agencies implementing peace-building policies has actually only served to strengthen my belief in my thesis that peace building is a form of counterinsurgency. Um, although, of course, there are some interesting nuances that I'm happy to speak uh, about in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mandy. It was a very important paper helping us in retracing genealogies among different fields of um, competence and what you did in the long-term perspective is more than useful to understand uh, today's situation. We are now going to open up in terms of a broader uh, regional perspective with uh, a presentation by Gregoire Mallard, who is a colleague uh, at the um, Department of Anthropology and Sociology of the Graduate Institute here. Um, Gregoire uh, 
has been working uh, on nuclear issue, and actually he was one of the co-organizers and participants of Track 2 negotiations at the time when he was at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, he then joined uh, and taught sociology at the uh, Northwestern University um, until he uh, joined us at the Institute a couple of years ago. Um, he is the author of a very important book, at least from my point of view, uh, published last year by Chicago University Press, whose title is Fallout Nuclear Diplomacy in an Age of Global um, Fracture. Please. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Maybe we can switch to the computer so that uh, Ricardo convinced me to do a PowerPoint, so I could not refuse. So, so in contrast to the my, my talk is going to contrast with the, the other two ones because you've been presented a very macro historical perspective uh, with macro political structures. And my talk is going to focus about a very tiny thing, uh, a figure of speech in a sense. Uh, which we commonly find in, uh, in peace talks, because after all, peace talks are talks. So in that, uh, in my talk, I'm going to talk about the use of analogies in uh, diplomacy, and especially in uh, the peace process in the Middle East. Uh, I'm just going to show you an example, for instance, of what I mean by these analogies. And they are analogies mostly between two regional orders, one in Europe pertaining to the past and one in the Middle East pertaining to the future. And this is a, a quote uh, from then Secretary of State James Baker when he opened the Madrid peace process. And he said, we live in an age where many of the world's region once ravaged by war are now coming together. With, we see this above all in Europe. The results are obvious, peace and security, prosperity, better quality of life. Increasingly, the Middle East stands out, but not in the way that should make any of us proud. Our challenge is to begin the process of making the Middle East a region not just in the geographic sense, but in the political, economic, and in the human sense as well. And during the, the Madrid process, if some of you uh, recollect, there were lots of such calls by uh, key political figures like Shimon Peres to actually emulate the approach that Europeans had just closed, in a sense, that was opened at the time, they thought, by the, in the 1970s, by the Conference on Security and Cooperation that was started in Helsinki. And uh, now that the Iron Curtain had just fallen at the time, and that there was for the first time an opportunity to get the superpowers, the US, the Soviet, former Soviet Union, and others to do something in the Middle East and to facilitate talks after uh, the Iraq war. Um, there was this constant appeal to Middle Eastern countries so that they look at what Europe had done and try to emulate that approach. So if you have read uh, your Edouard Said, you have doubts about this rhetorical figure. You think, oh, it's another attempt to present Europe as the model that the world should follow. Yeah. And, and in a sense, when I, when I was uh, either participating in these track two meetings, uh, where you gather a bunch of scholars and diplomats and, uh, and have them talk about something, I was struck that actually a lot of us were using this analogy, in a sense. And I was, even if I'm a reader of Said, I was thinking that there was some grain of truth in Said, but at the same time, it didn't capture the reality of the practices, the reality of how people use that analogy and what it was used for. So that's why I wanted to reflect in, uh, in, that, uh, in that chapter. And I thought it was also a good idea to present it in the context of these talks in, held in Geneva, because they reflect about the position and the role that historians may have and experts may have in peace talks, in a sense. Uh, because if you're going to look at the past of another region, 
you expect that historians may have a say. And it's not the, 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 traditional, uh, the traditional way historians think about their role, because in a sense, the, 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 the type of analogies that uh, Baker is calling for here are different from the historical analogies. Yeah. And so let me explain a bit very quickly this graph. But historians are, are used to actually do these historical analogies. An analogy, just to remind you, is a comparison between two relations. So it's not to say that situation A is like situation C. It's to say that the relationship between situation A and B could be similar to that between C and D. Okay. Um, that's the difference between an analogy and a metaphor. And there's a, a big literature, that actually, on the use of metaphors in international relations that was developed at the time in the, in the, in the 70s, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually, uh, by a group held, uh, led by Ernst May at Harvard and the Kennedy School, who tried to think about whether it was a good idea for policymakers to draw on metaphors when they make decisions, when they make foreign policy decisions. And the, the consensus actually coming from that literature is that it's a bad idea actually to draw on metaphors because often metaphors are misleading because you turn an analogy into which says the relation between A and B is the same as C and D it doesn't mean that C equals A and B equals D. D. But it turns it into saying that basically A is like C. So if we don't do anything, B is going to follow. And if we do not do anything, in D. Okay. And so basically, that you find that a lot, for instance, with a reference to Munich. Each time you have a military intervention, people say it's like Munich. If we don't do anything now, basically, if we have peace talks, we will have Hitler. And you find that a lot, for instance, uh, each time you have to invade Iraq, uh, if you're at uh, the State Department or at the National Security Council, you will say, it's like Munich. Okay? Uh, if we do not do anything, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, is going to invade the whole Middle East. Okay? So the, the, the historians in their own work are used to draw these historical analogies. When you read these three books, it's a traditional temptation. It's basically the essence of the work of a comparativist historian. Okay. But where historians move from their comfort zone is that when they draw what I call these forward analogies, where they draw the relationship between something they can observe, the relation maybe between C and D, and something which they can observe, E, and something they cannot observe, something which is in the future. So they basically propose that. They say, if we do have these talks, like the Europeans had in Munich with Hitler, maybe that will follow. Okay. And that is something that historians are a bit wary. And there's good and bad reasons why uh, the diplomats and more the politicians should be wary when they have very self-confident historians who arrive in the public debate and who tell you is that, you know, I can predict what's in the future. I can predict what F is going to be if I can draw that forward analogy. So that's it. what I've just characterized, in a sense, as the, the, the role of an historian uh, when he draws a forward analogy. Uh, which is supposed to guide the public debate, is um, a criticism of that use of analogies based on their lack of predictive value. A lot of time, uh, the researchers who have studied the, the use of analogies in strategic talks, let's say that more broadly than just big talks, they find that they have little predictive value. It's very hard to predict what the future is like just based on an analogy, even if you're a very well-informed historian, because many things happen. Okay. So what, what I'd like to, to, to propose to you is that this is true, in fact. When I'm going to show you what, sort of a, a, a sort of a very succinct uh, recap of what that use of analogies 
uh, what it led to when they were um, uh, referred in the Madrid peace process. And then I will tell you a bit about the, the current maybe uh, negotiations about the creation of a WMD free zone. And I would say that in the Madrid peace process, verified that thing that actually analogies have very little predictive value. But that is not all. I would also would like to, to, to convince you that their main purpose is not to predict what the future is like, but to constitute an alternative future. Yeah. And I think that may be something that is very hard in the Middle East from my amateurish position as someone who studies more Europe and global regimes than the Middle East. Uh, uh, that it might be something that is very hard in the Middle East in peace talks, is that it's both very hard to open the past to scrutiny, because you, it's like opening a can of worms, and it's very hard to imagine a future as well. Yeah. So what, I, what my claim in that chapter is, is that by looking at the foreign past, you avoid actually looking at your own past, but you still talk about something. Yeah. And you talk about something that helps you constitute the future. Yeah. What, I, what I find in, in practice and by looking at uh, the, the, the archives a bit of the, the, and the interviews and, uh, and secondary literature on the, the Madrid Priest process was that the, the policymakers did not draw on Europe's past to give better predictions. Okay. For them, the predictive value of analogies was nil. That's what I'm going to talk about. But it helped them constitute the future Middle East, a Middle East without, with arms controls uh, uh, mechanism in place, for instance, as an object of at least deliberation. Not yet negotiations, but at least they could talk about something that was not an immediate stop, that would not put an end uh, to conversation. So, uh, so these are the two uses of, pre of analogies that I'm going to contrast in the rest of the talk, the predictive and the constitutive use of analogies. So if we, if we go back to the Madrid peace process, there was, uh, as I said, you know, as you remember much better than I, the, the US and the Soviet wanted all regional actors to be around the table, but as is often the case, as, as we see now, with the uh, problems of that the facilitator to the Helsinki conference on the creation of a WMD prison in the Middle East faces, so that it's very hard to get all the actors around the table because of certain uh, diplomatic uh, problems. There's of course, the problem of recognition. Uh, as far as arms controls are concerned, you have two opposite uh, views. You have the position of Israel, which is simply said could be peace first, arm control stokes later. The position of the Arab League is the contrary. Arms controls and nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament first, peace later. So you, it's very hard to, to start getting people around the table. Then you have the other problem that as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, in a, in, as a rule of conduct, uh, Israel uh, uh, and some Arab states do not want to be seen as entering into negotiations. Okay. So what you can offer to them is basically a learning experience. Nobody's going to say anything if you bring a scholar like me or Ricardo in a room and tell them, OK, we're going to hear Ricardo telling us, uh, giving us a lecture about the Middle East, or someone like me who says, I'm going to give you a lecture on nuclear non-proliferation regime. I'm in my role. I'm a teacher, and uh, I have different publics. And so the, that's why you have also, to use Ricardo's work, in a sense, a peace, business, a peace industry uh, that develops in universities, in uh, institutes, that creates track to meetings where you basically have scholars who give an excuse to diplomats to meet. To diplomats who do not want to recognize that they're engaged in negotiation. They're not doing negotiations. They're just participating in a learning experience. Uh, 
so the 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 idea here uh, when uh, uh, that was done in the Madrid peace process as far as uh, arms control negotiations and nuclear negotiations were concerned was to learn f to, to sort of draw a catalog of best practices from the European experiment, experience. Okay. So what was interesting in Europe? You could think about many things, okay. but they didn't talk, for instance, about the process of EU integration. Okay. Think about European uh, uh, history, you could think, okay, maybe they, they wanted to look at uh, how the EU was created uh, and how France and Germany uh, actually uh, have come to reconcile themselves very shortly after the Second World War, six years after the Second World War. Um, and actually, in many track two meetings I've attended, there were talks about that, <laughs> about the coal and steel community that gave uh, uh, the floor uh, that were tabled. Uh, then this catalog of best practices, here again, we have to think, what is the use? Is it to predict what might happen? Okay. What good might happen? Here, the, the focus was the process that started actually after the EU integration was well in its way. In the 70s, there was this precedent with a conference in Helsinki where the superpowers met to start actually agreeing on very small steps, which are called confidence building measures. Like, for instance, you have early warnings if you have a military exercise to the other, okay, so that the Soviets would know that NATO is not going to invade them if they have vessels in the Baltic Sea. They would just tell them in, in advance, we're going to put a few vessels in the Baltic Sea. No problem. It's an exercise. Okay. You could also have exchange of military doctrines. Okay. So you could have a joint institute, for instance, with Soviet and American uh, strategists who would exchange uh, uh, their views about the, the nuclear strategies of their blocs. So this was started in the 1970s, and this led, so the story goes, to uh, facilitate the fall of the Iron Curtain and the coming together of Europe as a region. Okay. From small step, you got mutual trust. And one important thing that was included in actually this conference on security and cooperation in Europe was that there was a human rights component. There was included, there, so it was a broad view of human security that was included uh, the view that threats to human rights in one country would be a threat to international security, which actually was, some people still do not know why the Soviets agreed to that, because some say that Solidarność in Poland actually was uh, uh, empowered by knowing that it would not be completely uh, that uh, putting prison uh, uh, workers in prison would not be completely treated as a domestic issue, but as an international security issue. Okay. So it gave them confidence. So what happened in this group, which is called, a which was called Acres, the Arms Control and Regional Security, that was close to the in run in parallel with the Madrid peace process, and that and so they went to go to uh, different uh, centers of the Conference of Security and uh, Region uh, um, in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, to observe this exercise, this common exercise, how people uh, in Europe exchange on military doctrines, how they solve different issues. There were different seminars in Turkey, in Canada, in uh, in Cairo, and from that we could think, okay, maybe they took uh, the best practices and, and see uh, uh, what uh, with regard to human security, and they thought, okay, in their final declaration. That's what we need to do. We need to emulate. Not at all, actually. What they did is to find that, actually, the, the, the agreement was that for these important measures, this relation of causality that from confidence building measure you go to more structural measures, they, so this will not work in the Middle East. Okay. So same with human rights. In the final declaration, Saudi Arabia proposed that human rights, and it was endorsed by everybody around the table, that human rights violations remain a domestic issue. 
doesn't trigger a conference. Uh, Israel didn't say anything about it. Egypt didn't say anything about it. They all agreed with Saudi Arabia. Uh, so in a sense, you could say, what is the worth of this exercise? From the predictive point of view, nothing. They all find that actually each time you propose something that supposedly work in another region, it will not work in the Middle East. So this reflects of imposing singularity, like claiming singularity for the, for the, for the region. So that's why I say, you know, in a sense, it still led to a final declaration that was quite important at the time, and that led to actually the projection of a future. So that's why I say, in a sense, that the mid, the, these negotiations are not about the, the important effects are not about gi giving like a sort of rational predictions that any region should apply then to their case. It's to say that basically, no, they were important because indirectly, by talking about the foreign past, we were talking about something from, we were talking about something first, and we inferred what we wanted in contradistinction to that foreign past. And that's the operation I think we see today also in the case of the, uh, of the I don't want to say the, the negotiations because there's no official negotiations, but the discussions about uh, the WMD free zone in the Middle East deliberation. Here again, it's a, you could think that it's a very strange, that the metaphor, so the analogy to Europe comes back a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, there are, uh, for instance, it's not a surprise if Helsinki was chosen, okay, as cho was chosen as the city that would host such a negotiation if it was going to take place. There's the reference to the Helsinki process. Uh, there's also some uh, people, in, private people, including me, who have said that maybe looking at Euratom, the, Europe, the creation of the European Community of Atomic Energy could be tabled for this deliberation because it might serve as an interesting precedent, not in the sense that the Middle East should emulate it, but that it could be something that helps countries in the Middle East talk about some things that will be tabled. Okay. For instance, uh, uh, here I listed. For instance, the multilateralization of the nuclear fuel cycle, which we hear a lot about, or the creation of regional inspections and safeguards, or the creation of common regulative framework as to be applied for nuclear issues. Okay. Um, but as you see, what is interesting is that here again, immediately, we can, when, when uh, countries from the Middle East are asked to look at Europe to deal with questions of how to achieve a nuclear weapons free zone, we could say immediately, but this is completely idiotic because there's no region that has as many nuclear uh, weapons as in Europe. It's also part of this big alliance, NATO, whose security establishes very clearly that it needs nuclear weapons to ensure its Security. So its strategic doctrine is based upon the possession of nuclear weapons. Okay. So when you want to, to look uh, to draw the contours of a Middle East without nuclear weapons or chemical or biological weapons, it's not the first example that comes to your mind. Okay. If the purpose of using an analogy was predictive. But as I say, the more important thing is to gives a focal point, in a sense, that's how political scientists talk about that, a focal point on which to focus the attention of people that is distant enough so that there's no emotions, in a sense. And that's what this, uh, this, uh, uh, this use of analogies, I think, serves, is like to de-emotionalize the debate about the possible future. And that's in a sense, the, 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 the thing I would like to emphasize, uh, maybe in the conclusion, is that maybe these talks about a foreign past uh, could be seen as an alternative path to peace and reconciliation talks. Okay. 
Because when you think about it, how, what do you talk about when you want to build peace? Most of the time, the literature talks about Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We, we need, and, and as far as nuclear weapons in the Middle East are concerned, you start hearing some voices, for instance, uh, Avner Cohen has an important uh, uh, paper on, in foreign affairs on is, Israel should come clean in terms of nuclear weapons. They should, negotiators should come by acknowledging what they've done in the past. Okay. Like in the Truth and Reconciliation, you get the record straight, and then you negotiate. And, and my claim in that chapter is that actually I find in practice and by observing the, the record of the, uh, and the archives of this Acres process that this, this Acres group was remarkably productive uh, at that period and that maybe the truth and reconciliation uh, path is not the way to go, at least to achieve nuclear biological and chemical and a success in this negotiation toward disarmament. I'm not saying that it applies for Israel or Palestinian uh, uh, peace talks or in bilateral talks, but at least to envision a regional order that where you have achieved nuclear disarmament or biological disarmament and chemical disarmament, that might be a fruitful way to go, not because of the reason we may think about, but because of that reason. Thank you very much. Thank you for these very rich presentations. Maybe uh, I would like uh, immediately to open the floor uh, to the public for questions. I will comment afterwards. Uh, is there a, yeah, Alessandro, there is a microphone that can situate. You can raise your hand and we will come. 